Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Christine Phillips, and today's Generosity Roundtable is going to be on retirement. Now, many of you are probably wondering, um, why are we talking about retirement during a pandemic? Before we dive into the topic, I do want to discuss some of the financial priorities we should have during this time. Um, actually, these are the priorities we should have um, whether we're in a pandemic or not, but maybe you have a reduced income, maybe uh, you have lost your job, maybe you um, are in fear of losing your job, that you anticipate losing your job in the near future. So what should our financial priorities be? The first is making sure you have a fully funded emergency fund. An emergency fund is about three to six months of your expenses and that money is saved either in a checking account or a savings account, someplace you can get to it quickly in an emergency, such as when you lose your job. Um, during this time, when you're funding your emergency fund, you should consider actually stop funding uh, retirement plans. If you are doing that through your workplace, if you're giving a portion of your money into a retirement plan, consider stopping that actually for a season so you can build up this fund really quickly um, this is an opportunity to free up all uh, money that you can so that you can have this fund uh, saved within uh, 18 to 24 months and is generally the idea during this time you might want to see if you can do it um, over the next couple months and have that fully funded the second priority is considering eliminating non-essentials in your budget. One, this will help you achieve goal number one, which is save for an emergency fund. Um, and two, it helps focus your spending on just the non-essentials. So what are non-essentials? They are the four walls. That's what we call the, the um, or what are the essentials, I should say. The essentials are our four walls. That is food, shelter, utilities and transportation. So yes, we, transportation is essential. Even during a stay at home, you still need to drive to the grocery store to get uh, food. So um, you need to maintain your car. So non-essentials could be small, like a Netflix account, or it could be big, like if you do have an extra car that you're not really utilizing right now, and it has a large car payment on it, consider selling it. And that eliminates um, a pretty big chunk of spending in your budget that you can put towards saving. And the third, something that if you have lost your job, that may be very, very tempting, do not withdraw money from your retirement account. Why is that? Well, if you are under the age of 59 and a half and you withdraw funds from your retirement account, not only will you pay taxes on that withdrawal money based on your current tax rate, but you will also pay a 10% penalty. So let's say your tax rate is 20%. You, you, you will actually pay 30% taxes on that money. So if you withdraw $10,000, you do not have $10,000 to spend. You have $7,000 to spend. It is not worth it. Some of you may have read with the CARES Act that that eliminates the penalty. However, you still have to pay taxes on that money. It's just not worth it. It's just not worth um, compromising your future for money, for, for money that you need now. Consider other sources. Uh, Journey Church has a benevolence fund. If you need help, reach out to Journey Church um, to help in this particular time. So with all that, then comes the question, why talk about retirement? Because there is hope. Although it's a difficult time right now, people are healing, people are learning a new normal, people are being innovative on in how they are living life, connecting with people, and making money. We will have a future and we will have a dream so why not start now to save for it if you are able? So let's dive in on learning how to save for retirement. In Chris Hogan's book, Retire Inspired, he talks about the three Ds. They are dreaming, 
A dream gives you your motivation and an end goal to strive for. There is determining, and this defines the financial number you need in order to achieve your dream. And then there's discipline. This is developing the right habits to stay on track. So let's start talking about dreaming. I always think it's fun to dream. <laughs> So what is your dream? What is your dream for the future after retirement? It used to be that retirement was meant to go off in isolation. But nowadays, what it means is freeing up some time to be able to live the life you want to live, whether that's a house in the mountains, whether that's living by the ocean, whether that's travel. Take time to write down your dream. When you write it down, it makes it real and it allows it to motivate you in order for the future. So I'm gonna pause for a second before I go to the next slide. If you're watching this and you have not grabbed a piece of paper, grab a piece of paper and take some time to think and write down your dream. Okay, and then the next D is determining. How much do I need to fund my dream? What will be my anticipated monthly expenses during that time? At what age would I like to retire? These are kind of hard questions and hard to answer, but we do need to, you need to really consider what the timing is on that. And um, now granted age, it may still be a dream and trying to get there as if you want to try to retire early, but either way, Think about these questions. In this particular step, a financial advisor can be really, really helpful in helping you answer these questions and helping you set up a plan in order to determine how much you need to save in order to retire on, for your particular situation. Now, Chris Hogan, who's the author of the, of the book, Retire Inspired, at his website, he has a tool that he calls the RIQ, or Retire Inspired Quotient. Um, this will calculate the total dollar amount you'll need based on the age you want to retire. So you need to, on your own, at least determine at what age you want to retire. And on your own, you also need to determine how, what, your monthly, what you anticipate your monthly expenses will be. And we'll get into that in a second. There's also links at this website to help you find a financial advisor in your area that can help you. Another good set of resources is at Crown Financial Ministries. They actually have a whole series of calculators you can use at their website. And one of them is a retirement calculator that will help you calculate how much money you need in your retirement fund in order to retire. So next is discipline. What are the key habits that I need to do in order to save money? Well, the first habit is establishing a written monthly budget. This is your key tool. Not only is it a tool to help determine what to do with your income, but it can help you calculate what your monthly expenses are now and what you might anticipate your monthly expenses to be after you retire. Um, after you retire, you may have to pay for your health insurance where your company pays for that now. Things like that, you can at least get an estimate of what your expenses are in retirement. A budget will help you evaluate your needs and your wants. So as we talked about during this time, it will help you determine what are some of those non-essentials, those wants that I can eliminate at this point in time. This also allows you to prioritize how you wanna give, how you wanna save, and how you wanna spend. If you've never done a budget before, a good starting point is called the 10-10-80 plan. What that means is you give 10% of your money, you save 10% of your money, and you spend 80% of your money. However, I highly recommend you put an itemized list of what you're spending your money on because that's really the only way that you can prioritize and determine what you want to do in order to save more. The second habit is to get out of debt and stay out. Um, you want to try to pay off all your consumer debt, credit cards, car loans, student loans, um, and then save up for an emergency fund. 
we mentioned in the beginning of a saving up for an emergency fund. You're probably wondering why during this pandemic I didn't list number one to pay off all your consumer debt. If you can, that actually is a good priority. However, if your funds are compromised during this time, there are some of those consumer debts you may be able to call and defer if you really are in an emergency situation and need to save money fast. So that's why I didn't list it in the beginning, but if you are capable, pay off all your consumer debt very, very quickly and then save up for your emergency fund. Really, the idea of an emergency fund is it helps keep you out of debt. So that way you don't have those additional expenses. Um, also, if you can pay off your mortgage early, if you're capable of putting extra money on your mortgage and get that paid off, that is a good place to be in the future when you do retire. If you start itemizing your expenses on your in your budget and it will show you that probably about 25 to 35% of your income is going towards your mortgage. So can you imagine what your monthly living expenses and retirement would be without your mortgage? That um, could really be a big impact on how much you need to save in order to retire. It can also have a big impact on when you retire and having that mortgage paid off. And then habit three, work yourself up to be saving 15% of your income into a retirement fund. If you already have your emergency savings taken care of, you have your debts taken off, this should free up some income in your budget to be able to save for your future. And the goal is to save at least 15%. Now, what, uh, what retirement fund should I use? You've probably heard the terms, 401k, IRA, Roth, 403b, HSA. What are all these things? And what does it all mean? Well, we're going to spend the remainder of this presentation going through very high level what each of these funds are and then also go through a few different scenarios on how um, where to put that 15 percent of your income in order to save for retirement so are you ready let's begin so first is 401k this is probably the most prevalent uh, 401ks are um, funds that many private organizations, many private companies use in order to defer money from your paycheck into a retirement fund. It is a type of retirement fund. The numbers, uh, that number refers to the tax code that outlines the rules for this particular fund. What it does is as, uh, as you're deferring money from your paycheck into this fund, it actually reduces your taxable income. So it has tax advantages now in the present, which is great. However, at, when you reach retirement age, which is 59 and a half, and you start taking distributions, those distributions are taxable. But theoretically, you should be at a lower tax taxable rate upon retirement. So it still has some tax savings for when you retire. What's nice about a 401k is the employer can also contribute to an employee's 401k. Um, oftentimes you'll hear, let's say, um, that an employer will contribute match for match up to a certain percentage, or maybe um, like my employer um, will contribute a half a percent for every percent I contribute up to 6%. So if I'm contributing 6% of my salary into my 401k, my employer is actually contributing a number, another 3% out of their funds, not out of my paycheck, but out of their funds in addition to my 401k. So it's a really a great way to build up a fine, uh, retirement fund quickly. The contribution limit is not a percentage, but a dollar value. So by tax, uh, by, um, well, by, by tax laws, you can only contribute $19,500 per year, which is actually pretty significant. That's a lot of money per year that you can contribute. Now, if you're over 50, there's a lot of catch-up clauses. You'll notice as we go through this for when you're, um, actually it's 50 or older, so when you turn 50, um, that you can, uh, so your contribution limit is basically, what is that math, uh, $26,000 a year. And it's an additional $6,500 per year that you can uh, contribute if you're over 50. 
Now, something that's becoming more and more popular is called a Roth 401k. The difference is with a Roth is the money is withdrawn from your paycheck um, after taxes. So you do not get that tax benefit now. However, you get a tax benefit in the future. So when you do take distributions um, after retirement, um, they are tax free. So this balances out your taxes if you have um, a Roth 401k. Your employer can contribute to a Roth 401k. However, um, their con contributions are taxable. So it, it's almost like income when they contribute to a 401k. So you need to be careful about that. Um, and all the contribution limits, it follows the same tax rules. So all the contribution limits are similar to a standard 401k. Now you may hear the term 403b. This is actually very similar to a 401k, um, but it is for nonprofits. So public school systems here in the Roanoke Valley, Carillion is a nonprofit. So their retirement fund is a 403b. If you are listed as a 501c3 tax exempt organization, then typically the retirement fund you provide is a 403b. Again, all these numbers and letters refer to the section of the tax code that it applies to. So 403B, it reduces your taxable income, um, just like a 401K. Uh, when you take distributions after retirement, um, they are taxable, just like a 401K. So really, um, it, it's all the same rules um, as a 401K. One, um, there's a couple of things that may be different about 403b. Um, there may be a, an opportunity for if you have 15 years of service and that nonprofit, this is a lot, a lot of times it's with the government, that if you have 15 years of service, there's a catch up contribution available. Um, you'd have to reach out to your benefits, um, your benefits advisor to, to learn more about that. Um, in some organizations, they may call this a tax sheltered annuity. Again, a lot of that is with government where that you may have a pension in addition to this type of a fund. So there's just some other terminology you may hear uh, concerning the 403B. So there's the 403B. Now, Individual Retirement Arrangements, IRA. This is a, a private account. So any individual can open up um, an IRA to set money aside for retirement. So this is something you personally can set up. The contribution limits are $6,000 per year, um, or if you're 50 or older, you can actually do $7,000 per year. So there's a, a little bit of a catch up in there. Um, this is where we recommend you work with a financial advisor to help you set up an IRA. The money gets invested, actually in all these situations, the money gets invested in uh, mutual funds. Um, if you want, with a financial advisor, sometimes um, in an IRA, you can actually even have it a mix of mutual funds and stocks. So that's where working with a financial advisor is really, really helpful to determine where that money gets invested. There's two different types of IRAs. So there's the traditional IRA, and this is where you you're, you get that tax benefit now. So you're contributing money to that IRA and whatever you contribute can be deducted um, from your salary. So that way uh, it minimizes your taxes now. The Roth IRA um, is not that way. You don't get the tax benefit now, but you do get the tax benefit in the future. And this is, you know, again, similar to the Roth 401k. Um, the contribution limits are the same, but um, you, you receive your distributions tax-free when you retire. Now, there are some rules with a Roth IRA. If you are married and your combined gross income is 203,000 or more, or if you're single and your gross income is 137,000 or more, uh, you actually are disqualified for contributing to a Roth IRA. Um, however, um, most of us really can contribute to this and it's a great vehicle. Um, so that way, um, minimize our taxes in the future. Now, health savings account, you're probably wondering, uh, how is this a retirement vehicle? Well, health savings accounts are fairly new. 
Maybe you've heard of flexible spending accounts and that's something your company offers. A flexible spending account um, is an account that uh, helps uh, reduce your taxable income now. You can get money deducted from your pay. It, um, and, it, and it's used strictly for, uh, for medical expenses, but it's use or lose. So at the end of the year, if you don't use all that money in that account, it's, it disappears. So you have to be really careful about that. Health savings account is also a vehicle to save money for a qualified medical expenses. However, this account is yours and the money can be invested. And it, it actually, um, it, you know, if you don't use it at the end of the year, it just, you just, it's an account. It's actually, a, it, it is truly like a bank account that um, will roll over from year to year. And even if you leave your employer, that account is yours, you take it with you. And so therefore you can take it with you into retirement. So a lot of people are recommending if you have the ability to contribute to your health savings account, to add that as, as a option, not your sole option, but as another option to save for the future. And the contribution limits are, um, you can contribute up to, it's kind of an odd number, but $3,550 a year for an individual or 7,100 per year for a family. Um, and if you're 55 or older, you, you can add $1,000 per year catch up contribution for these. And like I said, these are funds that are strictly for qualified medical expenses, but the funds are yours. So it's a great way to save, to pay for your medical expenses in the future. Now, the one thing about health savings account, not all of us qualify you have to have a high deductible health plan um, that you are, and that is typically something um, in the range where you have, uh, I think anywhere from $1,500 uh, deductible or higher for an individual, and I think it's 3,000 or more for a family. It, you need to check with your um, benefits administrator as far as whether you're in a high deductible health plan or not. The other thing is, is you can have no other health coverage. You can only have that one high deductible health plan. You cannot be enrolled in Medicare and you can't be complaint, can't, excuse me, you can't be claimed as an dependent on somebody else's tax return. So there's a lot of rules with a health savings account, but check with your benefits um, administrator and see if you qualify for a health savings account and that you can add that to your benefits at work. So these were a lot of options. It's a lot of information. So now what should you do? Well, so here, there are a couple options here depending on what you have available to you and what you can do. And again, the get goal is to get up to 15% of your gross income saved into retirement funds, plural. So you can pick multiple. So here's option one. This is probably the most typical option. Start off by contributing to your company's sponsored plan up to your company's match. So again, if your company will match um, percent, uh, match 2%, um, if you contribute 2%, so in other words, they'll, they'll contribute percentage to percentage um, based on what you contribute up to a certain amount, um, then contribute up to that match. So if they match up to 2%, then contribute 2% of your salary, your company will match that. Um, then open up an, a Roth IRA with a financial advisor and contribute up to the annual maximum to your Roth IRA. And if those two, when added together, still don't add up to 15%, then go back to your company sponsored plan and increase the percentage that you give until you get to about that 15%. So let's go through an example to illustrate this. Um, hopefully then it'll make more sense. So let it, let's assume you make $50,000 per year and your company matches 2%. Put 2% of your salary into your company sponsored plan, which would be about $83 per month or $1,000 per year. Next, you would start setting aside about $500 per month to put into a Roth IRA. And this will max out your Roth IRA um, at the $6,000 per year. 6,000 is 10, 12% of, of 50,000, 12% of your salary. 
So now you have contributed 14%. So you still have 1%. So then go back, uh, look at your budget, free up some extra money, um, and, and see if you can increase your contributions to your company sponsored plan to 3%. So therefore you're giving 3% to company sponsored, 12% to a Roth IRA, and there's 15% that you're contributing to, um, to retirement funds. And doing it this way, what it does is it, it, it balances out your tax benefit now to your tax benefit in the future. Um, so you want you, you want both, right? So this allows a certain balance in um, getting a benefit for saving some tax money now and saving tax money in the future. So that's option one. But let's say you do have an HSA available to you. Let's add that to the mix. So now you have three different vehicles. This option is three different vehicles that you can use in order to um, in order to save for retirement. So first, the first option would be contribute to a company sponsor plan. Um, you know, so if your company matches 2%, contribute 2% of your salary to start. And then your second would be to max out your contributions to the HSA, to that max, whatever that may be. Um, and then if you're still not at 15%, um, go back to your company sponsor plan and, and enter it there. If they have a Roth option, this is a good opportunity to go to a Roth op option. Um, another option is instead of going back to your company sponsor plan is opening up a Roth IRA. I don't mention that here, but if you want to take the benefit of the Roth, so you have that tax benefit in the future, you can either do that through your company sponsor plan or you can open a Roth uh, IRA if your company does not have that option. So what does that look like here? And I realized in the previous slide, I had a slight error. Um, this is for an HSA, uh, 3,550 is the contribution limit for an individual. Not, anyway, let's assume you make 50,000 again, company matches 2%. So the first step remains the same. You're putting 2% of your salary uh, into your company sponsor plan. Um, Next, start setting aside, it's kind of a strange number, but $296 per month will uh, equal $3,550 a year for an individual to contribute to their health savings account. So that's about 7% of your salary in this scenario. So now you've contributed 9%. So let's free up some extra money in your budget to put 6% in, back into your, um, your company sponsor plan or a Roth IRA. Um, in order to take advantage of tax benefits now and tax benefits in the future. Um, HSA is something that gives you tax benefits now. When you contribute to an HSA, um, it does reduce your taxable income now. Um, those funds are strictly for medical, so there's really no um, future tax impact um, at all with that. But it helps pay, um, pay for your medical expenses. All right, so um, those are a couple scenarios and how to save for retirement. Now we're going to get into some frequently asked questions. And, um, you know, we're, we're in a format here where it's very difficult to ask questions. Um, if you're looking at this on, um, on Facebook, um, you know, put in the comments the questions you have there. If you're watching this on YouTube, um, it, you know, find find the Journey Church. Go go to Facebook. Just find Journey Church Facebook page. I will try to post there. So that way, if you do have any questions on this, because this is a lot of information, um, please feel free to reach out to me um, in any way you can. To and I will be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. But here's some that we know get frequently asked. One is, um, what if I'm self-employed? You know, what are my options? 401ks are really meant for much larger organizations. There are, um, you know, they do have to, to pay to, to, you know, have those types of plans. Um, there is one called a Simplified Employee Pension Plan, or you might hear it called a SEP. And these are really good um, low-cost retirement plans for, for any business 
but it's most beneficial for self-employed people. So if you really don't have um, uh, either very few employees or no employees, it's just you, this is a great option. Um, the employer contributes funds into a traditional IRA, so it's, it's a, a pension plan, so it's the employer contributing money into it. Um, contribution limits are 25% of the employee's compensation or $57,000 per year, whichever is less. So this option is just a, you can contribute significantly more into a retirement fund than you can into an IRA, which is what makes it really nice. The one thing is with a with a SEP is you're required by law to provide it to all employees. This is why this is really good um, for it, you know if they're self-employed or if you just have maybe one or two employees. This is really a great option. Um, it, it also you want to have an accountant or um, help you with these because they can help you the, as a self-employed individual these plans really help you um, benefit your business taxes now. That's really the big benefit with it. They can uh, look at what you spent throughout the year and help you determine how much to contribute if, you're, if it's just a single person um, every year in order to minimize your, your business taxes. If you plan on hiring a lot of employees, you may wanna opt for what's called a simple IRA. Simple IRA stands for Saving Incentive Match Plan for Employees. So this is great for businesses with 100 or fewer employees. It is similar to a 401k, but it's a lot easier and it's a, less, a lot less expensive for companies to set up and to administer. Uh, the contribution limit is 13,500 per year. And if you're 50 or older, you can actually contribute 3,000 in addition to that. So that is a simple IRA. So um, self-employed here, those are some options for you if you do not, um, if you um, want to save for retirement. The next question is what about Social Security? Um, Social Security actually was never intended to be a salary replacement after, um, after retirement. Um, the average monthly Social Security benefits in 2019 were $1,471 per month. That works out to uh, just under $17,700 per year, which is just above the federal poverty level for a family of two. Definitely cannot achieve your dreams on $17,000 a year. <laughs> we're, we're still going to get Social Security. I mean, it's it, most likely it's not going to disappear, but you need to think of Social Security as your bonus, not your base salary. So um, don't consider Social Security in your equation for your uh, retirement savings. Uh, that is a bonus. Um, and for that matter, um, one question I don't have here, but a question that often comes up your employee, employer contributions to your 401k. Don't count that in to your, that's again, is like a bonus. That's, that's a bonus. Um, when you're calculating your 15% savings, don't say, oh, well, my company's 2%, so I can count that as part of my 15. Think of that as a bonus. It, what it does is it just really helps your 401k to grow faster. So don't consider that in your percentage as well. Another question that gets asked that I did not add here on the slides. So like I said, you may have, still have a lot of questions uh, concerning um, retirement funding. Um, I am not a retirement professional by trade, just so you know, I'm a project manager by trade. However, um, I will still answer any questions you may have as best as you can. Um, if you um, can reach out in any way in comments um, from this, wherever you're watching this video, um, or send questions into Journey Church, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, however, it, it, my answer may also be to seek out the advice of a financial advisor. Um, they can help as well, really help you save for retirement. So I hope this information was useful to you. Um, I hope everyone is doing well and is staying healthy. Um, and I just wish everyone a blessed day. Goodbye.